Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, folks? Yep. It's that time. It's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show. We talk about all things music, motivation, and success, and so much more. It's a nice free-flowing conversation. Of course, I got musicians coming on. I got comedians, thought leaders, and the low-hanging fruit, the fraternity of drummers. Lots of drummers. Got to love drummers so much today. And this is long overdue. They're all overdue. I got a list a mile long of all my friends, and I'm so excited to have this Young man on the show today, born in uh -huh. Hawaii, ha, born in Hawaii, raised in Jacksonville, Florida, been drumming since eight years old. Same as me, six, so seven or eight years old. Um, he became a top call drummer in both the L.A. and Nashville scenes. He has worked with people like Taylor Swift, Kansas, Emmylou Harris, Trisha Yearwood, Denise Williams, Lee Bryce, Sean Mullins, Joe Nichols. The list goes on and on. Our friend Dennis Holt. What's up, Dennis? Hey, speaking of low-hanging fruit, should I be using this? <laughs> Do I sound better? <laughs> no, it's so crazy. Um, I'm so glad we got to do this because, you know, we're both we're both working drummers, and so it's very rare that we will get to see each other because we're in some recording studio somewhere or I'm right. on a bus, but occasionally we'll run into each other shopping for fruit at uh, Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's. <laughs> I always look forward to going to Trader Joe's. I might run into you. <laughs> you know what? It's the worst. It's it's some of the best food. Um, I love the culture of the company, but it's always the worst parking lot. It's like enter at your own risk. Brother, go over to White Bridge. Oh, yeah. We got three locations now. Usually, yeah. I'll make it over to the Cool Springs location. Um, right. That's a right. giant parking lot. Yes, it is. And the uh, White Bridge... I knew people over at the other one, and uh, I got tired of trying to deal with the parking lot. It's crazy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I mean, man, I got to, you know, it's uh, this is a treat because uh, we've casually known each other for quite some time. Yeah. And you, I love, you know, I love everything you've done. You've knocked it out of the park. And oh, me too. Thank you. Whenever we've run into each other, it's always a nice hug, and which we can't do because you're so far away, um, wherever you are. <laughs> and so, um, it's interesting. You had mentioned to me, I think after Bob Berryhill, the, the safaris guy, put the thing up about Wipeout, or somehow that went up, or I might have put it up, and you said, man, I need to get you out on the show sometime. Yeah. And I thought, you know, when it's when it's the right time, it'll happen. And it, can I tell a little story about that? I would love it. Yeah. So Bob lives here now, and uh, there's only one other guy that's still alive from from the safaris but he actually doesn't play so when they do shows his son lives in florida and he drums and he's a he's a pretty good drummer yeah but here's the thing when i was when we left hawaii and i ended up in jacksonville jacksonville beach i um i got my first first kit at nine now so here's the other thing i'm left-handed what but when I walked out Christmas morning and that drum kit was sitting there, Ludwig, uh, not classic, the Ludwig um, tension casings, one in the middle, you can still. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I walked out and they were set up the way they were set up and everything I'd seen on TV, I'd never seen anybody play left-handed. Yeah. I sat down and that's the way I've played. And I had a chat with Rod Morgenstein quite a while, a long time ago, and he got down to the University of Miami, and his his uh, teacher convinced him to switch to left-handed. I never did, but here's 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 what changed my life. So I'm playing this way, and doing Beatles songs. Even now, when I do, you know, if I've done Keggy gigs or something like that, he he's friends with McCartney. Always does a Beatles song or two. Sure. And I've had people come up and go, man, you, your fills sound like Ringo. And I go, I'm left-handed. We lead left. Yeah. But man, I know this is, you're too young for this. <laughs> but aren't you on a right-handed kit? Like it's all set up normally, right? Yes. Yes. And then you play crossover. Right I over do this, although I do open and I, I, I'm almost embarrassed to say open because man, the king of open playing is Simon Phillips. Good sure. work. 
And but I play yeah. open stuff if I'm doing Latin. So yeah. if I'm doing it, boom, 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 I open. And here's the thing: when Smoke on the Water came out, I was in junior high or high school. Yeah, you weren't born, I don't think. Uh, when were you born? Eighty? I, 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 I born seventy. Oh well. That was on the radio, I think, in what seventy four or something like that, maybe. Um, uh, I don't remember. Yeah, but I remember my mom used to party to that song. She's like, "I love oh. smoke on the water." <laughs> and, and, and. It's, what's weird is here I am chatting with you, and I'm, I'm, I've been. This is fun, and I could be your dad. Well, no, no, because I'm going to be fifty four. Well. An if early could, dad, if you got after it, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> so Smoke on the Water comes out. I sit down in my kit. You know, it was the whole kit in the bedroom thing. My mother was a piano player and she had organs. So we had all this stuff. And usually it was like, Denny, get your drum kit out. Family call me Denny. Get your drum kit out here. And we'd play stuff together. And then I was in a band at 10, 11. We'd play the officer's club, swimming pool or these places. Right. And man, I never got into this. I never got into this business for actually when I say the word business around Henson, he goes, it's a club. It's not a business. <laughs> right, <laughs> I didn't right. Yeah. How do, you, how, do you, how do you make a million dollars in the music business? <laughs> Start with Start. two. <laughs> Get up. And so I'm doing these gigs when smoke on the water comes around, I sit down and I'm trying, I'm watching. Um, well, I wasn't watching because Ian was left-handed. Right. Yeah. And, but I'm trying to figure out because I'm hearing and I didn't see that. I didn't see them on TV or anything. But uh, back then it was ba basically the Beatles you could see on Ed Sullivan show or something. But so I'm trying to do, uh, I'm raising my hand so you can see it. Yeah, yeah. Doing that, duh, and I went, this doesn't work for me. And man, I saw Stevie Wonder on a show. Mom, dad, let me stay up late. Uh, no, you know what? I would have been old enough. And, um, and Stevie plays everything. And I don't know if he's left-handed, but he sits down and he goes. And so on this one, instead of playing keys or whatever, he was going to play drums. Yeah. And a lot of those records, he's playing drums on early ones. So he goes, bop, 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 da, 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 inside, inside, inside. Yeah. I ran to my bedroom, jumped on the kit, and I went, dun, 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 boom, boom, in and out. Changed my life. So the left hand comes over as opposed to when you're playing 16ths on the hi-hat and usually like digga, digga, chaga, digga, and your right hand lead. So you, would, you were leading with the left hand and then bringing it over. Yes, bringing it under. Yeah, under. Yeah, sorry. So, um, bap, boom, death, jump. And man, I, I, I still do it. <laughs> well, it, it, it definitely opens up possibilities. I just had, I'm sure you're familiar with him, but, you know, Luke Holmes' is live drummer is this kid named Jake Summers, and he's a yeah. lefty, and he plays open. So, okay. but, so you go back and forth depending on the circumstance. Yes, I do. Yeah. But I play a right-handed kit, and I'm glad because, I've, you know. It's easier tours. to sit in, right, when you go to places, you know? Yes, sir. And on tours, I have several years, I and mean, this has happened more than once. A few years ago, I got a call from someone and said, hey, this is, this is, uh, I'm so-and-so, we got this band, we're getting ready to go out and do a four-band tour, one drum kit. Our drummer's left-handed. Can you recommend a young drummer that doesn't do that? And I, I, and I thought, man, oh, man, I'm so glad that I didn't. But there are certain things. So thinking about Ringo on um, Come Together, yeah. boom, boom, dun, dun, -da -da -dun, da -da -da -da. he goes up. Left-hand lead, yeah. Because going down didn't work really well. Yeah. So pr playing progressive stuff with some bands, I just learned roundhouse fills, but there are certain little things every once in a while that go, wow, I wish I were playing left-handed. So what I did for a long time is I put a, a hi-hats on the right with a remote, nice. the DW remote. And you and I have been with DW. I got a feeling. When did you go with DW? Uh, 2011. Okay. Yeah. 88. Yeah, baby. I'm one of the old guys <laughs> you're one of the ogs yeah i was with season, sonar season. for like a decade and then we you know we were all lead, like me and Derek roddy and thomas line we all just kind of went over to dw you know it was yeah and that's where i will be until i die great people great product great culture yeah. absolutely and i'm glad you're there and i i just i love and adore john
Oh, and uh, who I'm I Lombardi. pray for oh, every day. His health has been a little bit of this or a lot of this. I got to check uh, in with him. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I'm, man, I've been meeting. Well, now, do you live here and in LA? Or- I did that. I was doing that for like a decade and then very, very aggressively back and forth for about six years. And just recently, I gave up my place out there and I'm just in yeah. Nashville. Yeah. It gets hard, doesn't it? I did it for years way back. Yeah. Um, man, if, if it works out, I want to fly out and just literally to go have lunch at that at the spot. At Oxnard, yeah. I used to do it all the time with him, and since I've obviously I've not been out there and I haven't seen him and with NAM's not going so you know, they're not doing they're not showing up to NAM. Yeah. And uh man, we ought to grab us a flight and go out and <laughs> say howdy. I kept, you know, I kept a gigantic locker of drums in Burbank just to keep me tied to California. I'm taking a break from California, but I just, I can't ever get away from the ins- inspiration of the blue skies and the palm trees. I'm, a, I'm like a sun chaser. So <laughs> when this is all comes and goes and I have to figure out where I'm going to do my final years, it's definitely going to be Florida, Texas, uh, Arizona or California. I got to have the sun, right. you know, uh, Arizona. I don't know if I do Texas. Florida is very affordable. I look at yeah. them and well, so you thinking about the sun and palm trees, dude, Hawaii, <laughs> you know, I was going to say like, now, how is that? What, what, how, that is a very, uh, great place to be from Now, What did your parents do that they were in Hawaii? My dad was Navy and he, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, he and his brothers joined up. Dad, dad, well, 10 kids. Wow. So, are you familiar with the Sullivan Act? You're going to tell me all about it right now, and I'll probably jog did you see? Did you see Saving Private Ryan? Yes. Okay, that was based on the Sullivan Act. Okay. So dad and his six older brothers joined. Dad was too young, so he falsified his papers because he wanted to, to go. Wow. And they because of the Sullivan Act, all seven of them ended up sent to different places. Dad got Pearl Harbor. Wow. And when he got there, it was a smoldering mess. Dad was in electronics. It was wonderful. At the end of World War II, his duty was up, and a CO came to him and said, you could make a career out of this. I'd love to see you re-up. And my dad said, you let me go home to Virginia, marry my sweetheart, and you bring me back to Pearl. I'll do it. And you know what? That's what they did. Wow. Wow. But my mother had emotional issues. He didn't choose well, which I didn't choose well in my situation. He didn't. I mean, you know, mom was great. Uh, she had severe emotional things. And after one typhoon too many, she went to dad when I was seven or eight. And I might have a sister. And uh, he, she said, I'm going, I'm taking the kids to the mainland. I'd never been to the mainland. And he, he said, we go to the mainland. Um, we're going to live on the beach somewhere. So we put in for San Diego and Jacksonville Beach, because there's three naval bases there. Ah. So I finished junior high and high school in Jacksonville, had a moment at the uh, University of Florida, and then and then I loaded up and went to California. Nice. Okay, so, so, so you uh, took a stab at college. Were you studying music in college? Well, what happened is, so in my senior year, my band director, uh, if, if I can back up a little bit, because I'm going yeah. to explain. I want to, I'm going to explain to you. So I know, well, one, I want to ask you, this will show you that I know a little bit. What band were you in? One, two or three o'clock or five or six. And you went to North Texas state, didn't you? Yeah. I, I played drums in the one and percussion in the two. Nice. Crazy. I know of, I know of it, but I, what happened is man, Jacksonville. Um, it makes me wonder if, well, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, Things have been great. I have no complaints. Yeah, of course. But I, uh, my parents took me in for a lesson when I was nine. I had had the kids, so I would have been ten. And um, and the guy at um, Marvin Kaye's, drum dude, took me in. He had a little kit facing each other, behind glass, you know, and uh, and he'd show me something, and I'd go, "Oh, you mean this? I'm ten. Yeah. Show me something else. So we did this two lessons and he went to my mom and said, get him into, get him into band and just encourage him to play all the time. Well, she never had to do that every day. I've, I've had to have a deal with her that 
when my homework was done, I could play as long as she didn't have a headache or something. But uh, so you had you you had the bug at ten o'clock at at, at, I, at ten at ten years old. I, I did, and I um, and man, people ask me uh, when I do a class, uh, and and redirect me if I veer off somewhere. But uh, so people ask me if I and when I do a master class or a, or a clinic, they go, "What record got you into this? Yeah. What record influenced you?" Brubeck, time Big out. Five, Morello. Come on, dude. I used to fall, put it on my mother. My mother, being a musician, had this huge console console that would rock the house. Yeah, and I learned that if you put the the LP, and I still have her. She taught me how to take care of a record. I bought the most desired one that was two hundred dollars because that record means a lot to me. But I still have hers from nineteen fifty nine. Good for you! Wow. And uh, but I would put it on side A, and I learned on the console that if you took the arm for other records and lifted it and held it over this, not the arm, but the whole thing that held, and moved it over, it would play whatever was on over and over again. Oh. I'd fall asleep in front of it, and man, I, I should have learned a, a, another language. <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. I, I can hum. I can hum all of Paul Desmond's sax solos. That's incredible! Wow. I fell asleep time after time. And so that record influenced me and Morella was a big, and so then the, the odd time thing, when Carrie Livgren brought me down to, to do some playing for them back in the 83, uh, you were 12, uh, no 13. <laughs> yeah. Um, I sit down and he goes, man, so you're, you're doing sessions in Nashville. And I said, yeah. And he goes, you've got an uncanny ability to play odd times. And I went, well, especially five, four. <laughs> so, anyway, we had fun doing it, but mm. I, I got into a drum and majorette core, uh, as a young kid, there's pictures with me holding a, a, a drum. Then in seventh grade, I got into junior high band. Thank God. Yeah. People like you and I actually went to school and there were programs there was music programs man yeah. nowadays you got to be at a private school it's really really bleak and 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 that's the reason why i bring i i bring up texas all the time because the culture of music education in texas is unparalleled as far as like a state that supports the arts you wouldn't think that but right right it's it's heavy man it really is okay that's um so so then when i got in the seventh grade i didn't know any better and i just we i started beginning beginning band and after the first day you know there's mr ridge walt ridge who i thank for having a career such you know man teachers are so important i know you've got a, you've got a string of them you can mention sure and walter ridge played trumpet and after the first day he did auditions for everybody and he goes dennis you're in the wrong class and i go i didn't know my parents didn't know i've never had he goes you're going to get bored here. I want to try to move you. Well, he couldn't move me because of my other classes. So what he did, and I kind of wish I'd have carried on with this. He gave me one of his trumpets and said, I would like you to keep you interested. Do your drum work. And then I want you to work on beginning trumpet. Oh, like Greg Bissonnette. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Greg's a wonderful guy. I love him. Uh, Except when he plays with Ringo, he's not left-handed. And those fills don't sound left-handed. Yeah. I told Warren, we, we toured together for years with Carrie and the guys. And he was an auxiliary guy with, with Kansas. And I said, and we had breakfast after they were here the last time. And the whole show was amazing. Ringo's great. Greg, you know, Colin, Colin Hay. Love I Colin mean, Hay. Geez. and they both sing in the stratosphere. And um, and so we're having we're having breakfast at Fido's. Nice. And he goes, what'd you think of the show? And I said, well, as much as I love Greg, I was just being silly, but kind of going, to try, is there an opening? As, as much as I love Greg, he's such a gentleman and a great player. I said, he's not left-handed. And he goes, I knew you were going to say that. Because so, <laughs> <laughs> Warren's done this. Anyway, so I did this. And then in, in, um, in eighth grade, Mr. Ridge, I don't want to sound like... I'm just gonna say I don't want to sound like all about me. I guess you're. <laughs> this is all about you. This is all about us shining a nice light on you, man. Cut all this stuff out uh, if you don't need it. And uh, but Mr. Ridge, so this is this was my upbringing. 
I, uh, as far as you mentioned who, who I studied with, and I thought, well, this is, I studied with Joe Morello and I studied with Ginger yeah. Baker. And Mr. Ridge, this is fun, man. I get, you can tell I get excited just. Heck yeah, man. This is about dr- drums and life. Do. Yeah, <laughs> of course. And so in eighth grade, he sent me down for an audition for Jacksonville All City Band. He goes, I'm going to do this, but I want you to understand you're, you're too young. And I don't want you to be destroyed by it. I want you to go and see what it's like. And next year, I'll send you back. Well, I went down for eighth grade. And man, I, I was too young because mostly ninth graders, you know, back then it was still called, that was called junior high, not middle yeah. school. And so uh, I ended up first alternate. All right. So I got to attend the gig and just in case. And the next year, he sent me back again and I was first year. First chair, all city bands. Nice. And then, I, then high school, I was first chair, um, but you couldn't be. Uh, did you march? I did. Yeah, I did four years in the, uh, high school and four years in college. Okay. So I love the core. I loved every bit of it. And I got a little taste of it doing the drum and, and majorette thing because we're marching up and down fields and, and competition. So my sophomore year of, of uh, auditions, I ended up first chair, but you can't be section leader. Section leader has to be a senior. Uh, I was too young and stupid to be a section leader anyway. So I sat first chair all through school, which I'm sure you did too. And in uh, between my junior and senior year, that band director sent me to University of Florida for an audition for all state band. I sat first chair. All right, man. That got me. Now here's where I, it's not a regret because I don't believe it's a regret, and I wonder what if or, but I first chair gets you a a shoe into a a scholarship. There you go. And I passed on it. Second chair took it, and he actually he got the gig. I knew that I wanted to be a drummer, the re- for my whole life. Sure. But I wasn't sure. I wish I'd had some better counseling. I wasn't sure how to approach it. And I'm not so sure Florida, University of Florida, which I am a Gator, I'm not sure if University of Florida was the place to do that. So I, I, when I graduated, I did a, a, uh, a junior college in Jacksonville, brand new, did their, got into their music program, and I was learning more chord structure and all this kind of stuff. And man, I got called to LA to, to do a gig. And you chose and that, I, went that direction. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, you know, most people, you know, I always when they, when they say, "Hey, you know, I went to Berkeley," I was like, "Well, did you finish?" Because most nine times out of ten, the people people go to a school like that, it's almost like a trade school, like MI or something. It's like you get some experience, you get exposed to some great things, and you're already in this amazing city full of music. You know, yeah, so yeah. So what year was this? Your LA was robust scene. It was we're talking like eighties. No. Um. So I ended up in LA in uh, 76. I played around, I did stuff in Jacksonville, played in a horn band. And boy, was that a great experience. Yeah. And man, that, that, uh, here, hang on a second. May I? Uh, of course. You- yeah, like 76 in Los Angeles. So this would have been the time of, uh, God, who would have been the Supreme Session guys back then? That was post Hal Blaine. Post right? Hal Blaine. Keltner was on fire. Jim Gordon was. Killing it. Gordon, yeah. Um, man, Paul Lime had gotten there and he was lighting it up. Maybe and I John, John Guerin, maybe. Uh, John Ge- well, John Guerin had kind of. Uh, maybe. Um, he wasn't on his way out, but he was. So, uh, um, uh, Pooh Bear. Um, I met I met both of those guys uh, within the first week, uh, and I went to Mama Joe's. And 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 sat behind Keltner, and Keltner was my inspiration to become a session player. There, yeah, and he's still doing it, still pulling off the shades indoors. You know what I mean? Because there's usually people will be like, "There's two types of people that wear shades indoors: douchebags and douchebags." And I, and you know, I have been that guy. I just try to buy the ones where you could see your eyes. But he's got like a condition yeah. or something, right? And and. and yeah, and that's that's a good point because 
Being light sensitivity. Guy, yeah. If someone ha- is wearing them and I can see their eyes, I'm going, okay, I'll let you have it. And, yeah. um, and, uh, the, uh, and I thought, okay, this is an amazing place. This is crazy stuff. In in Florida, I had started doing sessions. So I'm, I'm 18, 17. I graduated 17. So I turned 18 a month later. And then I get, I'm playing this horn band, some other bands, but I play in this horn band and we're doing Blitz Went Tears, Chicago, uh, all the other cool stuff back in the 70s that was on rock radio or AM with horns. And then the horn players would sit down and they'd either, or they'd either sing and we were doing all the other cool stuff and top yeah. 40. I, man, talk about chops. Nine to one thirty, six nights a week. And I've... That's you four know, sets. Four sets a night, six nights a week. Yeah. And so I, I, I ate it up. I was young. You wouldn't catch me doing that now, but <laughs> I'm young and I'm eating it up. Yeah. And by and playing that stuff, we're playing some odd times. Um, uh, there was a, one of one of the Chicago tunes. It was it was a break. That's a, uh, I'm trying to think of what it's called. I'm so I went bon, da da down da 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 yeah. to come in and record. Well, I'd never done that. I went, sure. Okay. And I went in and I, my first sessions, the engineer, I learned a lot about getting drum sounds because I've never been in a studio and that, but what happened is he goes, man, for a young guy, you, you kind of, you're doing this, man. Of, yeah. I'm alive doing creating stuff. And I got to meet Dennis shows. Remember Dennis shows in the class, but well, you wouldn't sure. Dennis shows in the classics. And, uh, some, some of the, uh, some of the lead, the, the singer, like Leslie with, uh, with Leonard Skinner was on some of these dates. And then about two years later, this is going to sound like a brag moment, but it's kind of weird because I actually went, I don't think so. I get called when uh, the golden, when Leonard Skinner went to Europe and did the golden earring tour, they were kind of tearing it up and they came back. Sweet home Alabama was a hit. And, but I think I want to say Bob Burns with the drummer at the time really went nuts with that stature, drugs, alcohol, TVs out of the window. And so they fired him and I got a call. Well, I wasn't a fan. I, if they were opening for like mountain, Leslie Weston Mountain, you know, Mississippi yeah. Queen. Um, Corky, Corky. Yes. And I, if they were opening for somebody, I'd go an hour late. <laughs> I just, I, and, but man, when it came to uh, the Alma Brothers. Yeah. Every, they played my sister's high school prom as the Alma wow. Joys. So every time they played, I went and saw them. And so it wasn't like a Southern rock thing. I didn't like, there was just certain things that bothered me. Plus Ronnie, Ronnie was known for drinking a lot, getting high. And actually the bass player, the great bass player walked yes. over to him on stage during sound check and popped him in the mouth and knocked a tooth out. And I went, yeah, I don't think I need to be with that. So I turned, I said, no, thank you. Um, um, I've got other things. That that's I'm gonna, pretty incredible when you turn down a major band like that so early in your career. I mean, that's awesome. You had well, a vision. I did. And I, some people go, well, you nuts. And I went, well, my mother called me because we didn't have social media back then. My mom called me. I'm living in LA. And she goes, she goes, God was watching over you. And I go, what? I, well, I believe that. What are you talking about? And she goes, the Skinner plane went down. And I went, oh my right. gosh. She yeah. goes, Danny, you would have been on that plane. I go, mom. It was a call to come and just sort of play and jam. That doesn't mean I would have had it. And she goes, well, anyway, so. Yeah, you might have been in that plane. That's so cute that your your family calls you Denny because my family and my close friends call me Richie. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Dude, you can call me Denny. (laughs) Okay. All right. All right. And um, so, hey, at that time in the recording scene, 76, was that was the time of no bottom heads and tons of gaff tape, right? Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And I had, I had that kit. One of these yep. days I'll, I'll, I'll text you just for fun. I'll text you a shot of me playing. I was, playing with, 
Yeah. I went, uh, my first kit was Ludwig. Then I got into Rogers and I got to tell you the Jasper Swivelmatic. I ended up with a big Slingerland kit because Nigel Olson first tour in America. I went and saw him, saw Elton. Yeah. And you know what he changed about my playing was he was so musical because he was a singer. And I just thought, wow, I need to, I need to listen better. And it's not all about what I can do here. And man, I got to tell you, know, people, people ask me, man, you've had, so dude, I'm 70 now and I'm as busy as I want to be. I don't right. want to, I don't think, I, I mean, I, I mean, I love it, but and I've got a lot of tracking at home, as you know. And yep. um, you're in. Your, you, if you guys are just listening to this, uh, Denny is in his home tracking studio, and there's lots of flashing lights and computer screens. And I bet go. if he's, yeah, <laughs> man, you know, come back. Oh, yeah. there he is. Yeah. Um, the uh, man, you know. Um, I've, so you 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 had your you were talking about getting into starting to do some recording. Yeah, and what so what what happened with me? My favorite compliment, Richie, is <laughs> I mean you know I've I've we we got Vinny and all these guys that can just do all this crazy stuff. Sure, and and then I can you know progressive for me uh, a little more straight ahead approach, but on sessions, people ask me, man, what you know what what is it? How did you get on these things? And I said, you know what, I really. I really feel that I've had a wonderful career by listening well. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I've listened to things that I played on in the 80s and 90s going, wow, I wish I could do that over again. You yeah, know, that, that is, that's a thing. I mean, yeah. Playing too much or, or this. And, uh, and then the other thing, and I don't know where it comes from. You do it when I hear you play. My other favorite compliment is that I play with intention. There you go. And I, I had to think about that. And then I was doing a gig and somebody goes, man, I can just, I can just lean into you. And I, it's like a lazy chair, no matter what the tempo is. And I went, oh, that must be what he was talking about. And, um, but it's just, so then I've, there's other people, I won't mention names, even people making way more money than me that I can't, when I'm there at, at the gig, it's like, oh, I'm, this doesn't make me feel good. Dude, you got it all over you. I mean, when you're playing, it's, hey, boys, this is where it is. Yeah, let's do this. And, and um, so those kind of things I learned to listen. But I still, even listening, I still hear things from from the past or whatever that I go, well, I'm, just, I'm playing a little bit too much. Yeah, you know what? I, I hear, I mean, dude, I hear hits from our early days where I was like, man, I wish you had just played a little bit less on that thing. You know what I mean? But you, but we're in the songwriting capital of the world. The way we play drums, we're in we're in the right city because it's all about that tale being told. It's about that vocal, staying out of the way of the vocal, and then trying to create some very special Mona Lisa moments while really not making about ourselves at all. Yeah, yeah, yes. And so I, I like to think I'm, I've kind of got into that thing. Uh, you, you, that I've yeah, approached it. Yeah, totally, totally. So, man, so. Um, so what are your first I, opportunities in, uh, in, in Los Angeles? I mean, you're, that's a very, you're a very young man. I mean, that was like before you can even get into bars legally, right? 18, Yeah, 18. and I was, man, I was doing that. Uh, I was playing bars. I was playing bars in a band in high school. And because I'm, you remember, I'm tall. You were tall, yeah. And I had longer hair, and um, I, when I'm in L.A. or somewhere else, I have longer hair. Here, it just kind of it gets it's too humid; it bugs me. But <laughs> I was playing playing these clubs, and I never got carded. But I wasn't a drinker either, and I was doing that thing. And in in L.A., what happened is I, I was touring with these guys, and then I'd come back, and people would start me, calling me to come in and do dates, and and I went okay. And I thought, wow, this is fun. I've, I've, I've done this in, before in Florida. Now I'm really, this is wonderful. And I am, so you remember Three Dog Night? Oh, heck yeah. The keyboard player wore the cape and all that thing. Skip Conti. Floyd Sneed, right? He's the drummer? 
Yes, and boy, it was great. But yeah. but the, the the keyboard player had gone in. Some people had they had invested in this place out in uh, Irvine, and it was called IAM, International Autom- Automated Media. Gotcha. And you might rem- remember Stevie Wonder's song, but song in the key of life. The next one was Secret Life of Plants. Yes. They brought me down during the day, and I'm that's way. But I lived in Huntington Beach Laguna, living the dream, man, Laguna. Oh, gorgeous. Surfing. I grew up a surfer and touring, and I come home and surf, and then I tour, and, then, and so it was awesome. I and I'm single. Are you still uh, surfing? Do you still do you still get it done, or what do you think? Like a Russ Kunkel, I think, still does it. Does he? I, I, you know, I never, I didn't never knew that. Oh, wait a minute. I did know that because yeah, Kunkel's he, Kunkel's been a lifelong surfer, and one time I I got to meet him and I asked him. I we did a rock and roll fantasy camp together, and he uh, I said, uh, "What about the sharks?" And he goes, "They're always there, and there yeah. will always be there. You can't worry about." It. I was like, "Are you kidding me?" It's worse. If I found the sharks worse in Florida and, and on the East Coast up, and uh, hammerheads are everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I'd be in the water, and I remember a guy. 20 25 feet from me starts screaming and yelling he's kicking kicking and he ended up with 65 stitches in his foot a hammer a small hammer had chomped down on him Ugh. and we'd see him in the water all the time as soon as we see him man we're out <laughs> we're out of the water Dude. this was before jaws came out wow and once jaws came out it was probably a month before i got back in the water because that was like oh dear god california surfing there was great because the waves were stronger bigger and i loved I love big waves. Yeah. And the thing there was getting too close to sea lions. If they had babies and they're on rocks and you get too close to them, they will come at you. Wow. So, but what happened is I got called by these guys to come to this new studio. And I had this big slinger on chrome over wood and they were single head, but I had switched them over to double. And uh, no, wait a minute. They were still single then, still single. And they, uh, I got to sit on a date and I'm way over my head. Snuffy Wald was playing acoustic. You remember Snuffy? Snuffy played with Stevie and he also played with Bill Withers. Wow. And he also did TV shows like 30 something and all that great, great guitar acoustic. And some of the other guys I can't remember. I wish I could remember. And Skip Conti is producing and he's like the head cat. And he goes, man, getting drum sounds, your tempo was just locked. And I went, I'm arch core. <laughs> so, but, you know, I, and I think you know this. When we all sit down to just do something, we all have a tempo. You're right. And when people like you and I hit it, man, it could there could be bombs going off outside. And it's going to stab. It's going to stay right there. Yeah. I did the date. And, uh, and the band... Uh, ended up having a couple of hits, New York and the, the main, and I'm trying to remember what they're called because the main guy in the band married Donna Summer. All right. And I'm trying to, that's good. Married up. (laughs) Yeah. And so I, um, I get to New York and this guy comes to a show and he goes, you played on my brother's album, my brother's band's album. I can't remember who they were. Anyway, it was fun. And that really, I got bit, I got bit big time by the by the session thing and i ended up flying i'm going to jump to see how i got here am i getting dark i can open this you know I what's realize- going on you know it's really crazy it's kind of fun it's almost like uh, martin scorsese's in there with you the camera is moving in and out it's going wide and narrow and it's coming in on you is that just an ipad how is it doing that i guess the ipad's doing it i'm sorry oh i see that you see what's going well, on it's just constantly and I moving pink. i'm really pink aren't I? I, I it's a weird setting i don't know if i never even noticed that an ipad can do that I'm gonna. I didn't either. <laughs> All right, hang crazy. On, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna see if I can bring some light into this action. And um, it's all okay, good, man. It's smart. It's a smart. It's a smart camera. Yes. Ooh, now that's kind of bright. Um, so I, I I get brought in a guy from LA keyboard player, and myself. We get called, booked to come to Nashville to to do a record for yeah. Benson out on uh, the Benson was on a big, big studio on uh, Metro Metro Center area out That's there right. on the river. And I thought, wow, this is cool. Never never been to Nashville. Never thought about Nashville much. And uh, my dad was a big Loretta Lynn fan and all the other country stuff like that. Yeah. And if he hadn't been gone, he would have he loved 
knowing that I got to play on a record with her. Uh, and, um, and that was a special treat for me just thinking about my pop, but wow. I get brought in and this was way before your time here. I, I hate to mean saying that, but you, you are a younger lad. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to think. So this is the seventies Nashville. That, it's 79 now, wow, 79 yeah. and 80. And, um, on the date was a guitar player by the name of John Gowen, who I think when you got here, he was, he was, he had, he got into Eckenkar with uh, Seals and those guys, or he was a little bit different. Um, they were in something. Anyway, by the time I came back, because I moved away, I was I got in the circle, dude, and then I left. <laughs> Family, my, my yeah. that's, that's a long story. I won't get into it, but I came back single. But when I, I was leaving and, and Crowell, Rodney Crowell calls me up and he goes, are you out of your beep mind he goes you're you're the guy you're my guy you and michael rhodes and i went that's wow. kind of a family thing and i don't know he goes hey just move her out and come back and i thought well my dad taught me differently so i did come back but it was a few years later yeah. and everything had changed but the so what happened is john there's another cat local who i can't remember to be honest with you and we're sitting at lunch one day and john going goes man after tracking with you for a day or two, this was back when we would, you know, people booked for a week or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those days were fun. And um, he goes, man, this would be a great time for a drummer like you to move to town. And it sort of flipped something on in me, but I realized I've never, I've never been landlocked. I've always been on the ocean. Yeah. Florida, mm -hmm. California, Hawaii. Six months later, I rolled in May 31st. Uh, 1979. Oh. Well, you know what? It, that actually, by the time I moved, it was May thirty first, nineteen eighty, and John had said, "Hey, give it, give do cassettes, put cassettes everywhere." I did like a hundred cassettes, dropped them off everywhere, nothing. And then what happened when I started? Once I did a date and started doing more dates, guys would go, "Man, how long have you been here?" And I told them, "Like, I said, I wish I'd have known you were here longer." And I go, "I dropped a cassette off with your sec secretary." It never works. Yeah, no, it never works. But what happened is guys like, and I, you know, Gary Lund. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Gary and I did a date, and then Spady Brandon and I did a date. Ran into Spady yesterday at Third Watch on 8th Avenue. Really? Yeah. No, it was great. I was sitting there with two drummer buddies from the East Coast, uh, Larry Aberman and Wayne Killius. I'm sure you know I Wayne. I know Wayne. Yeah. And La Larry, Larry has done time in uh, New York, L.A., Vegas, and he is in Nashville now. He was the drummer in Zumanity for 18 years in Vegas. Oh, wow. Okay. So we're sitting there having breakfast, and in comes Spady, and Spady goes, can I join you guys? Like three drummers and a bass player walk into a breakfast pot. He lives up the street. What crazy. He's a block away. Yeah, we, we used to uh, do those Keith Falaze sessions where we do 21 songs a day. I did them before. I did them back in the day. Yeah. Because of Spady, and I just went, dude. That's a <laughs> lot of work. That was That's actually my record is the 21 songs. Yeah. I, uh, man, Dan Huff, we used to go out to slaughters back in the early eighties, uh, different keyboard players. And it would either be Mike Brignadello or Gary Lunn, Dan Huff, or maybe I'm trying to think of who else would have done that. Jerry McPherson and myself. And we, they'd have us booked for a 10 and two by, by one we had done 10 songs and we're on our way home. Amazing. And, uh, you know, man, when the charts are right and you, you just listen and go, all right, I got this. And normally when they were doing a playback, I was doing a shaker or tambourine or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, but 21, um, I go to Clarksville, uh, great band charts are done. Acoustics done click scratch vocal. And we will read down. We'll read down 12 to 14 songs and we're out of there by three o'clock. <laughs> It's, that's it's, like, it's such a factory. It's so interesting. And and maybe this was never like this in Los Angeles. I'm sure like on the card sessions in Los Angeles where you're doing film dates or a Marvel movie or, you know, it's got to be cha 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 cha. But all the things that I've done out there for singer songwriters and stuff, it's like, uh, get here at 10. I meant, so I show up at 845 to get drum sounds and they go like, you're 75 minutes early. I was like, I thought we were down beating a 10. It's just, it's always, it seems very like slower. Like here we are just like, let's go. Yeah, man. I'll tell you what I learned. So I was one of, uh, 
man, we're gonna run out of time. There's just a fun stuff, a bunch of fun stuff to talk about. I, because of my dad uh, living in LA, and because of Kunkel, I heard sim- syndromes. Yeah, and he was playing them double, and so was Pooh Bear. And uh, and I went, oh, I'm getting notes. So I call up Pollard, and I go, I gotta have a kit. He goes, okay, here's my price to you guys. And what I did is I called my dad and I said, dad, these, I got these little pads and all this, but I've I've got this stuff. I want to trigger it. Dude, this is where you are. You are a marketing whiz. Me, I've had so many opportunities of other things that I just kind of went, well, this is what I need to do here. Check this out. Go do this at Radio Shack. I got these Paizo tweeters, went to a hardware store and every four toms i mounted a uh a piezo and then i with this kid i didn't mind i just i i, I drilled a hole well a single head it didn't matter but when i went double and i had little jacks on them and uh, the i got the brackets that you could sort of raise and lower and i got them right right up to like a 16th inch and then the, the syndromes you could you could adjust quite well. Yeah. And so I would do, I would match them pitch wise. And it was like, boom, boom, boom. And then when I was doing a solo, I had the brain right here and I'd get into this big solo thing and I'm playing a big kit, cymbals everywhere, drums everywhere, roto toms, the whole thing. And then I'd go, and I'd do this thing and get it out of the boo, boo, boo thing. You had to do it all by hand. Yeah. And then I'd go, so then I, I went all Carl Palmer on brain salad surgery. <laughs> and I'm doing this. Nice. And I said, Mad scientist I, shit. <laughs> yeah. And I did that. And then um, I was having so much fun with that stuff and doing it all, a lot of other days. And I end up here. And because of, so Spady, I get into the music row side. Gary Lund's got me into jingles and a lot of the CCM side. I was say you did a lot. I've done a lot of Christian rock here. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at your wrist. Yeah. Here. yeah, yeah, And it, it, man, it was wonderful. Um, within a year or so, I uh, again, I always want to hate sound like I'm bragging, but within a year or so, I, I was, I was doing ten to twelve sessions a, a week. Fantastic. And turn, turning things down. That was the kind of work back then. The yeah. '80s. It was on fire. And so I'm doing this and this, and then I'm doing, and I, and I become at that time I was Scott Hendricks first call. Yeah. Scott calls up and says, Hey, Tim Dubois and I, you've done sessions for him. We're putting together a band and we're picking our favorite guys. We want you to drum. And I went, so, okay, who else? And he goes, Greg Jennings, Larry, what's his name? And it's, and and the the band's going to be called restless heart. And I went, Oh, really? That's kind of a cool name. I did we not know this story, my friend. We recorded the record. Michael Rhodes was the bass player. Yeah. So we recorded the record. Now, because they're they're they've retired as a band, and Dietrich has retired as a player. John Dietrich left Nashville, I believe. He retired. Did he? So I'm going to tell you something that I made a promise to Scott that I would never say. So we had. We well, had don't do it whole- on this podcast. <laughs> We had, we had done the whole record. Yeah. And then uh, I guess a year later, all of a sudden, Tim and Scott go, Hey, we got a record deal. Who's in, who's not. And Michael and I both went, Oh, we're doing other things. And I had started working with the Kansas guys, which it took me out of a lot of great sessions, but it was fun music to play. Sure. And it was short lived for me. And, um, it was fun to, it was a side band called AD and Kansas. So there were, all the other guys were either auxiliary players or it was Dave Hope and, and they have a legal agreement of so many players have got to be in the band to be Kansas. So, and I know Steve Vai's coming to town in October with Tony and, um, and Danny Carey playing at the, uh, sure. And uh, Steve Vai's band, I can't remember what they were called way back. Uh, they would open for us. It was fun. Wow. So this, so the Kansas thing, because I could have sworn that in maybe like 2017 or 18, uh, Phil Ehart was back with them, and I went to go to a sound check to say hello. Oh, no, I, 
I only did this in eight, 83 to 85. Gotcha. So, so we're like Phil was on a break or. Yeah. Phil, Phil and Steve had already wandered off. There was interchangeable parts. Phil's the one that put it back together gotcha. and it was Phil. And then Carrie and Dave went, we're done. I don't want to do this anymore. Wow. You know, bass player, Dave, Carrie Libgren, who wrote all those amazing hits. The dish, and, the uh, dish. Bap. Yeah. Fun to play. I bet. And, uh, and then what they did, they brought in uh, John, um, uh, Italian John. Um, I would help you out if I could. <laughs> singer, high singer. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They owned. Uh, oh, John Elefante? Elefante, thank you. Yeah. They brought John in. And man, the last time I played with him, we played a lot of those songs and some of his a few years back. And I went over to him and I said, dude, you are singing. Well, I think you're singing better now than you were back then. Wow. And he goes, wow, that's, I, I appreciate that. And awesome. uh, he was bummed that Carrie didn't pick him. Carrie had picked Warren Ham, who went on to be with Toto and Ringo. Anyway, we had fun. But uh, so I was doing all this stuff and I had basically bowed out. What happened is I'm standing at a, at a uh, ended up back in LA and I'm standing at a bank in Burbank. And I hear this, let the heartache ride tonight. And this first single. And I'm right now is signing my check, and I got and I, I held it because I heard I heard this thing, and I went, bow, doom, bow, doom, da, doom, 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 doom. and I and I held it, and I went, oh that's my me. God. And the gal goes, sir, is everything okay? And I went, that's me drumming. And she goes, oh, that's cool. And I called um, I called Tim, and I said, dude, why I didn't get a copy? And then when I did, and he goes, man. Sorry, and when I got a copy, Michael Rhodes and I had additional musicians. And I said, what's with this? And he goes, well, we, we told you guys we didn't want it to be a studio band, hired guns. And but what happened is Scott, before when I told him I was leaving, they brought me, they brought Dietrich and the other guy, the other bass player, the new bass player in to track two songs. Can you hear me? Yeah. Scott brought me in to replace ah. those two, and I ended up being on every song. I, and I got to tell you, I'm kind of proud of it. It was a fun record to do. There you go. Yeah. And then, and then from there, it was just oh, stuff. You know, it's on the resume, but yeah, it was it was a it was a great time. And then I ended up in Colorado. I wanted to live in the mountains, and I was working for a production company and going here some in L.A. I've been back 22. I came back in 2000. And uh, everything's different. I think you came right after that, didn't you? I moved here in March of 97. Oh, okay. Yeah. I came back in 2000. Po post boom. Because there was a boom. Yeah. Gone country. And then when yeah. I come here, J Jim Riley, I mean, I move here. Uh, my graduating class here is me, Jim Riley, Lee Kelly, Pat McDonald. That's kind of like we came in at the exact same time. Right. And we're right. trying to figure out what this scene is going to be because it was in 97 it was kind of sleepy and we're in nashville was trying to find itself again and i'm playing with like ronna reeves and there's giant records and regina regina is out you know there's a blonde and a brunette and it's you know james stroud produces super slick pop country sounding thing you know yeah, yeah. um then i start working with pam tillis did you play on some of her records i did i did and i did uh i did uh a bunch of dates with her and um that was fun i liked her a lot yeah she's still at it you know one of the things that i had played on was um she had a pop moment yep she kind of veered away from dad and all this stuff and did kind of some pop stuff and then kind of came back yeah. and uh yeah. she's she's still doing it she's lovely um that was fun stuff uh Man, if I wasn't playing, there were, I mean, a lot of other guys, Brignadello and all that, but if I wasn't playing with Michael Rhodes, it was Spadey. Spadey got me on, man, a block away from here, Sound Emporium, Spadey got me on. Uh, I walk in and I go, hey, who are we playing for today? He goes, you might know him as Hank Jr. And I went, Hank Jr.? Wait, Hank Jr.? Oh, Cephas. Dude, I've never been more afraid in my life. He was still drinking a lot, was waving a 45 around. Quasi-violent. Shot a hole in the ceiling. Wow. 
And, um, but he's on my resume. <laughs> yeah, Bo Cephas, man. Well, yeah, I just interviewed Lee Kelly. Lee's been his drummer. Keo's been his drummer. Nick Boot has been his. I mean, it's a kind of like a rite of passage that to, to play yes. his band, you know? Yeah. And now I'm a block from there. Whenever anybody comes into town and I'm and, and they're using me as band leader, they always I always recommend that I'm Juanita, I you know, friends and family discount. Yeah. I love that place. And especially once they redone did everything and they got the APIs. And uh, man, is there anything I, I'm just been rambling on like crazy? Well, no, we're, this is what we do on the show. We just ramble. We, we, we're, <laughs> it's just like two friends having a cerveza together. Um, yeah. So I'm just trying to think if you live a block from block from Sound Emporium um, with the way Nashville is with real estate, you're doing great. I know that neighborhood. Well, I used to have a girlfriend that lived on that. Was it Clayton? I think it's Clayton. Yeah, Clayton. Oh, God, I this was 1999. I was dating a girl that lived on Clayton and I was like, this is cute. And oh, there's that there's that famous studio. I can't imagine what those houses are going for now. Oh, well, my God. It's it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, and I'm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great area. Uh, my girlfriend is a few miles over in the tree houses off of 100. You get up over on the backside of Percy. Yeah. You turn right. It looks like Colorado and. Yeah. And um, yeah. so we're about to, I'm going to join her there and uh, we're taking a chunk of that place down below. That was like, you open this little half door and there's 1600 square feet that was never finished. And that's with, and so that's going to become my Your studio, my studio. Nice. But I love the area of Spadey's up the street. Uh, I've got a, fr a lot of friends. I walk across the street to it's martin's a, or the by right it's incredibly convenient area man i mean really, yeah. really. remember remember they used to sunshine grocery used to be there it was like the only oh, health food right store. yeah now it's now it's right the uh school of rock yes <laughs> now it's a school which i have taught at it is crazy yeah. i could i could picture that so you did time you did time in florida you did time in colorado you're in los angeles you're in nashville you're going back and forth then you settle here in 2000 and then there's another there's another boom that the early aughts things are happening. Everyone's putting out their pop country records, the Martina McBrides and the all that. And you've been in the mix the whole time, man. Well, a good part of it. And um, back and forth. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's been what you know, what what you and I missed. Uh, and everybody said, man, you left you left too soon. And I said, well, I, it was a family thing. I really it was yeah. weird. Hey, the redeeming thing of that that keeps me from running off in the woods naked, screaming and yelling, which I kind of do anyway sometimes. But <laughs> well, aren't you aren't you like a big biker? Um, yes, outdoor, yeah. and you had an accident in a couple uh, years back, or and it was uh, six and a half years ago. I was yes. in an accident. I got hit by a deer. I I would ride from here out of my driveway, and I have a town loop, and uh, which I like. Uh, early in the morning, and I on a Saturday left early in the morning. I was going to go out toward Leaper Fork. Fork. I I got into distance cycling because I can't surf or snow ski here. Right. I also got into snow skiing in Colorado, well in California, and I I taught skiing at Winter Park one day a week because it got me a season pass. I got hit by a deer. I'm out not far from Paul, uh, not far from Paul Lime because I was actually. He said, "Man, when you're out on one of those Saturdays, give me a little warning. Come by and have a cup of coffee." Well, this was a morning, September morning, and I thought, gosh, I'm going to get close, a little closer, and I'm going to just call Paul and say, hey, coffee? And I went down old, you know, so um, Sneed, yep. left on old Natchez, mm -hmm. and you go past Moran, down the hill, which had been repaved, and I, man, do it again. My type of snow skiing is super GS. It's flying no gates and you're just you get air and you're just skiing skiing it's good. not little stuff and i i'm big skis because bumps i'm too tall i'm six 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 and a half I'm rub it big. in man come on six too big well <laughs> you're the perfect size i'm too big for cycling surfing everything else and um i go down that hill and my my thing is I'm, I'm, i'll brag about a top speed on a on a bicycle tires like that yeah 58.8 miles an hour but oh. that day I hit 40 and in my periphery, I see something coming at me. And I had been taught if you if you sense impending doom, get your butt out of the saddle 
get one pedal unclipped and get away from the bike, get ready to get. And the deer hit me because I stood up. It hit me here, broke three ribs, ah. spun me around. And that's what took my life. I, a cardiologist, this is the way my life works. Cardiologist found me. And he said, nobody was home. He goes, Dennis, it took me over a minute to get anything. And um, did, did you see the light? Dude, now my son's a doctor, my oldest who's been trying to call me, which is no big deal, I'll call him later. But my that son is a, a doctor, and he was doing neuro, neuro at the time. And wow, said, you got to be pretty proud, man. A drummer oh, I, produced a doctor <laughs> from his loins. He's my retirement. That's great. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. Um, I didn't. What I did is because I was instantly transported somewhere else, man, dude, I was in, I was in what was the best, closest thing to paradise. I remember I had like two seconds and I thought, this is going to hurt. And man, it was like, boom. And that kind of trauma, I had a friend that was a, 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 a pro, semi-pro snowboarder. Yeah. Did, did a trick, hit a tree and he was instantly dead from the tree impact. The oh. deer hit me here. I'm doing 40 and it probably weighs 250, 300 pounds. No light. And my records, which I got a copy of my records show that I was visibly and verbally disappointed when I, when I was re when I was brought back. Wow. Yeah. And so I asked, Hunter, you were somewhere that you were enjoying. Yeah. That uh, was, uh, yeah. And Hunter, I asked Hunter, I said, if people ask about the white light and he goes, dad, the white light in neuro world is if you're, you're usually it's someone that's on a bed or whatever, and they are slowly dying. And what happens is the brain is usually the last thing to go and everything, if they're at visibility or whatever, everything, any kind of light or whatever, everything just goes like this. There's no tunnel. Yeah. And, um, but man, it was wild. It was I'm wild. so glad I remember. I remember when that happened. I couldn't remember the details, but congratulations. You, that's so great that you were able to heal and rehab and, and, oh, and yeah. this, just emotionally. That's, I mean, I've been in traumatic situations in my lifetime and that's, yeah, that stuff kind of stays with you. Little PTSD things, you know, yeah, that, yeah. that rear well, their ugly head, you know? I did a, a, a ride. I started riding again. I got myself back in shape. Took a while. Uh, yeah. I've got a titanium plate here. Eight screws. Wow. Broke these ribs. Broke my clavicle and my scapula. And um, and man. But I'm you're in great so shape, man. There's a lot of 70 year old guys that are walking around with giant pot bellies. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, well, you're in, you. you're in you. shape and that's good. It just it requires work and focus and intention and effort just like anything else, man. Well, I've stayed, I've been active my whole life and I got to tell you, it helps with drumming. Absolutely, and man. I can, I can do a 10, two and a six and I'm still at it. And so I, 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 I love cycling guys turned me on to it. I was going to say PTSD. The first time I was with a few other people and they said, do you, are you okay doing the ride that you didn't finish? And I said, yeah, let's do it. Wow. And I got to say, when I went down that hill, I was like, I'm looking, I normally would never look away and I'm looking over, is there a deer over there? So I was a little, a little shaken up, Sure. but I did it and I went, you know what? I won. And Paul yeah. asked me, he goes, man, is there anything I can do? And I said, well, man, when you, if you come up that part that way, if you see a deer with a limp, that's I want the backs, I want the back straps. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Cause so, when you say a deer, um, a female deer is ways. It says a male deer. Well, I'm not sure, uh -huh. but it was big enough. What happened is it jumped off the hill because deer will jump at everything. Yeah. And there was nobody on the road. Nobody in front of me, nobody. By. And I asked the doctor, I said, did you see me in front of you on Sneed or on Vaughn? And he goes, no. And he goes, well, I might have been further in front of you. And he goes, well, again, and I don't know how long you've been lying there, but I found you turned around and, and going facing back to the hill. And I told him, I said, what I remember, and this is the other thing, Hunter and then my trauma surgeon, I said, is it, is it weird or is it good that I remember everything from leaving the driveway? And he goes, usually people with the trauma you experience, they don't remember what they had for dinner the night before. He goes, because you remember everything, 
that's really good for your brain health. Yes. And uh, so I'm very thankful. Yeah, man. I am. Thank, thank God, brother. I remember before that. I had the surgery, I got back, I was doing uh, some record dates. Uh, I've got a few clients that loved the, um, the butcher shop, uh, which is gone now. It's, a, it's not condos right down the river. Of course and it's condos, so yeah. Sean and condos. Yeah. Um, Sean Sullivan engineering. I mean, Sturgill, a lot of guys, Johnny cash. And I love tracking down. It was vibey. And, um, my first date before I had surgery, I went in, I sat down and I went and they, everybody said, man, are you okay? You're going to be able to do this. And I said, yeah, I've been practicing at home. Everything's fine. But I said, I'm, I'm going to raise the floor, Tom, and I'm going to bring the ride symbol in and this crash and they're going to be lower because reaching out with a broken clavicle was killing me. So it was like, everything was like right here. Yeah. The symbols, as we age, the symbols come down. <laughs> they 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 come down and it's like you know but now i got to put them at a, i still want to be able to relate to the audience and stuff so i'm almost at a point where i'm looking over the symbols you know what i mean to right see, to see the audience Man, and a lot of guys you know i mean steve jordan i mean everybody but i've, I've looked at i'll see pictures of me when i was 18 19 or whatever and they're way up here the Indugu. And, <laughs> oh <laughs> yes and Hermie, who was uh who played with uh tower of power for a bit what's his last name oh herman matthews yes he had the ride symbol way in the stratosphere. So I yeah. tried it a little bit. I thought, okay, this is, this is it. Bang the man, when, you're on stage, when you're on stage, you want to see the guys, you want to see people. Yep. And um, so anyway, man, you know what? It's, um, That's the only one, time I, I, I put my, I put my ride in the air. The only time I maintain that is for Pete Coleman at um, Treasure Isle. When we do the Aldean records, because he's like, no, I, I want that. <laughs> Get the symbol out of the Tom Mike's love. And so, you know what I mean? So I put it up way high for him. And, yeah. um, you know, the folks at Sabian, they, it drives them crazy. But, you know, Pete is like, you'll love this. But Pete's like, I really like pasties, love. They just go away. So <laughs> I use pasty crashes for Pete and Pete alone. You know what I mean? It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, man. That was the thing about Scott Hendricks. There were other players that were keeping the symbols were low. Back in 80, 81, 82, 83, they had, if things were down and mine were still way up. And Scott goes, I love that you keep the symbols out of the way. Yes. And, uh, and they've come down a bit, but not, they're still not in the, in the way. Well, and, so what is the, uh, what is a, a typical kit that you take for, you know, to, working here in Nashville? Is it a one up, two down, or just a one up, one down? Man, my typical, especially with cartridge. Or even without, if I'm taking something else, you know, cartridge these days is really hit and miss. But, nice. um, and I'll go out, like I, if I go out and I'm out at Dark Horse a lot and Dave will make sure I get, I said, look, cartridge is going to cost you a fortune out here. Here's what's funny. Cartridge to these places, or I was out at. Um, cartridge Insta. makes more than we do. Yes. <laughs> and uh, cartridge. Love you, Harry. <laughs> to, yeah. And I said, it's my fault. There's all these house kits in town. Uh, cause I'd been with Harry for way back oh, sure. and, uh, and the, um, so like an insight, it's 350, 375. Yeah. People freak out about it. Dude, truth. When I was living in LA and I, uh, pro rock because of, because of Paul pro rock was doing my gear next to me was Stan Lynch's stuff. Yeah. And across from me was the yes guys. And I thought, oh, boy, this is a ma an amazing warehouse. But for them to take me from uh, North Hollywood mm -hmm. down to different studios in Orange County, oh. 1988, 89, 90, it was 350 then. That's kind of like 950. Yeah. And I get here and everybody's freaking out about, you know, this and that. And uh, so when you, when you, you have, the, when you have oh, the, uh, back, the house, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, so, when you have a house kit situation, do you have one DW drum that can, snare drum that can cover everything? Or you got two or three that you can bring in up? Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I, um, and John knows this. <laughs> my record date, my go to is a, I've got a six and a half black beauty that's been on a lot of records. I had Mr. Ludwig sign it when I got it. Yeah. Uh, I think John understands that. I think John, he understands. does. Yes. And, um, 
man, I got a Blameyer. Sometimes we got to get together. Like yesterday, I was with John Root up the street for coffee. Yeah. I need to have you join us. I'll bring, you know, remember Blameyer, right? Yeah, yeah. Dude was playing, that was his single headed toms. We all thought they were Ludwigs. They were Blameyer. Wow. I have a Blameyer snare. I've got a Craviato that John had, you know, that John. And these are the things I keep with me all the time. Cartage has all this stuff, but I always drag. And then I got a Montanary that suppose it doesn't matter to me, but supposedly it was one of the last ones he made. And I don't know if you ever met him. Uh, no, I he, didn't. No. Back in the day, he he could be a little rough at Nam. I'd walk up to him, and I remember going, "Wow, well, I love this piccolo," and he goes, "It's a soprano." And I go, and <laughs> you're probably an asshole. And so, excuse me. <laughs> yes. And he, um, I liked him, but he he definitely. Rough was, around the edges. He was brilliant. And uh, I'm sad to see him go a couple weeks ago. But I've got this Montanary that, that goes. And then so my, my, my main kit that has been, Garrison's giving me a hard time all the time uh, regarding Big Yella. Cartage named it Big Yella. Okay. Y-E-L-L-A. It's a 24. I had called John years ago and I said, man, I'm on a yellow Jag, but I don't want the, um, the canary yellow. And I've picked out, I, I sat at a coffee shop with swatches of yellow and I picked slicker yellow. And Garrison's going to go, dude, it's going to look like a school bus. And I said, not if you don't put orange. I don't want orange. This is not orange. So anyway, I, I, I talked to John and I said, he goes, all right, what do you want out of this kid? I said, I want keltner big warm but i want focus and he goes oh so you want two kits <laughs> <laughs> so i got a i got a 24 nothing super deep and uh 24 or 16 got, yes and i got a 10 a 13 which i've never done mine have always been even 10 12 14, 12, 14 16, 16 whatever and i'd always get two kick drums and whatever snare but i'd get a small and a big kick and with this one, I said, I just want the 24. I want a 10, 13, and I want a 15 floor and an 18. 15, and wow. I, I need the 15 and the 18 to sound like, boom. And, you know, when the Keldner does that thing, uh, and, man, I'll, re I'll reach around and hit that and a switch and just, mm -hmm. and he goes, okay, here's what I'll do. 10, 13. 15 and 18, I'm going to do the cross laminate, pattern. Yeah. Cross pattern. And that lowers the fundamental. Man, they sent that kit to me. I can't stop playing them. So I usually do, usually two up, one down, or two up. Sometimes on bigger days, if I need more, I'll do two up, two down just because it looks better. Uh, I will do one up, one, one or two down some. Uh, a kit that I carry that's ready to go when they're not paying cards, it's like I'll go out and somebody will pay me half. Yep. Uh, and then if I'm at Dark Horse, they got all those guys to help me get in. That's actually a two up, and it can be a two down, but usually it's a two up, one down. Nice. And then it's always, years ago, it was symbols everywhere, just crazy stuff. Um, so I'll do Crash, sometimes a Splash in there. Mm -hmm. I've got producers that let me use a Splash, and there was one some <laughs> that, I, that just got no Splash. Don't ever bring a Splash. So one day I went in, and I asked Carter. I, I totally I, stopped bringing the Splash, but you can get away with it occasionally on some, like, some highbrow, like I could see, like, Kristen Rock or Red yeah, Day yeah. or, you know. Yeah, and so I stopped doing it, but one day I, I said, so, dude hates Splashes. I want you to find every Splash I've got that I haven't used, I haven't used in years or anything else, and I want you to use hats, symbols, ride. I want all splashes set up. Hilarious. And that producer showed up, walks out to look at the kit, and he just goes, I think I don't care. He goes, I knew it. I knew you would do this. And That's I hilarious. said, I had, to. I had to do it. But normally, crash, ride. I used to do crash, crash. Yeah. You know, the Bruford setup. <laughs> but I went, I had a, engineer and producer complain on a record I was doing in Texas out in the, out in the Lindale Tyler area. Yeah. Yeah. Down there, Tyler, right? Texas been there many times. Rick's yeah. place. Love it. And, yeah. uh, I, they just said, man, is there a reason why you don't have your ride in the crash switch? Cause the, the overheads are so close. So I'm like, come on. Anyway, I started experimenting kind of went, so crash ride crash 
Swish. Yeah, that's me too. And that's my setup. Yep. And um, as a matter of fact, tomorrow I, I called, I called, uh, I called Tim, and I said, "Man, I've avoided this when Andrew was doing it before he went with with uh, Gretch." He goes, "You know, I know, I know what you love, and if you're doing bright stuff, so I'm, I'm still kind of a six oh two. I'm, dude, I've got six oh twos that I've had." since I was in high school, that's what got me into Piesty that and bottom and those guys. Yeah. I still have them. Wow. And the records they've been on. <clears throat> yeah. And I don't, I won't rock with them. I don't want to break them, but I, they'll, they'll do a lot. <clears throat> and, um, like that, the, uh, the six Oh twos that I was using the blues. The last time I saw Jeffrey Bacaro alive, I was at Chenay's, which I tracked out a lot. I love that room. You ever mm. played there? Where's that? Oh, it's gone. That's right. That's right. Bill lives here. Bill Schnees. Oh, gotcha. It's gone now. But Jeff was there, and I'd gotten invited over to just kind of hang. And he goes, and, you know, I had that low voice. And he goes, man, sit down behind the kid. He's wearing cowboy boots. He drummed in cowboy boots. I can't do it. No. I can't either. No. And uh, I sit down, and I go, you know what? Manager Caro always told me you and I played the same thing. He goes, yeah, he told me. He mentioned you. And uh, 602 blue medium hi hats. We were using 16, 18, or eight. yeah, usually 16 and 18 or 18, 20 mm -hmm. paper thin 602s. Wow, that were lovely, mic friendly, but we would you beat the crap out of them and they'd end up with a dent. And then a 20 inch medium ride. And I sat down behind his kit and I went, Oh my gosh, it's the same thing. The one thing he did is he kept his drums higher and tilted back a little more. I'm trying to remember how I've seen your setup. I, I sit uh, low, and that's what I've been told, like Tommy Aldridge low. And I, I wish it wasn't the case, but I've tried to change it over the years, and it really is hard to teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? When you got tens and tens of thousands of hours in the trenches, I you're know. just like, hey, this is working. Let's go into the night. So I can just look at a chart and not think about anything else. Or look over and smile at somebody, and I'm not yeah. going to bust my knuckles. So I, yeah. I just leave it. I leave it the way it is. Yeah, just, uh, just, um, just, just execute, you know. And so, hey, what are you doing these days for? Um, from loops, are you doing the machine app on your iPad? Do you have a physical an MPC or a rolling pad, or are you, are you using the Spectrosonics? What's your go to to knock out a loop really quickly? So I have all the uh, uh, Eric with Spectre, with Spectrosonics is a dear friend. As yeah. a matter of fact, he said, can I borrow part of your name? I had a, I had a sampling company as on the side in LA in the Valley. And I would go in and do samples for people Great. or give them on my own. And I called it, I called my big rack, the Boptron. Yeah. And my thing was called Boptronics. The, the goes, greater rack. He goes, I really like that. Can I borrow part of that? And I went, yeah. And he goes, I'm going to call my company Spectrosonics. And I said, that's, I think that's brilliant. Wow. <laughs> you're, you're responsible for this, Dennis. <laughs> So I was doing all that and man, I was doing loops like crazy. And then all of a sudden nobody was doing them. And now I have, I have a couple of simple apps to do. And for live, I would just do a laptop and it would be, I dump everything into pro tools. The, a, a lot of the guys I'm playing with, they don't want that. Mm -hmm. And, and I wasn't going to spend gazillions on, on something to, to do that when nobody else wants it. But I, I mean, if somebody called me and said, I need you to do this next week. I'd be all over it. Sure. But what I've been doing with a few people, Jimmy, 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 um, Nicholas, Jimmy Nichols, not Nicholas. I went to a high school with Nicholas. Jimmy, Jimmy Nichols. Nichols was the guy that showed me how to read a national number chart on the floor. <laughs> and he writes sloppy charts. Yeah. But he's, he's brilliant. And I love him. We are, we're family. Yeah. And um, a lot of people, uh, what I'll do is I'll do, I'll, I'll do my, I'll plug into my app, I, I, my iPad and I carry a, a universal audio thing and I can do stuff there. And I said, look, any more than this, if you don't want, you know, I'll do live percussion. And uh, on the other side of the screen, I've got congas, surdu, bongos. Yeah. I, I have a, I have a cajon stack. It's a surdu uh, tilted back on like a sandbag. So it can, it'll bring a little bit more. Yeah. Uh -huh. A cajon on top of it, and I play it with my hands or uh, brooms, the synthetic brooms, and uh, 
mic each and then put one further away and man, either playing it with the brooms or my hand. And that's, that's a whole new world now. Wow. Cajon stack. The and, Cajon uh, stack. That's what I call it. <laughs> it's amazing. That's amazing. And, uh, now, I love percussion. It's really crazy how many guys are very opposed to it or they're afraid of it. They don't venture down there. And it's just like, this, this is a whole world you got to explore, man. Yeah. Dude, I would play at church in LA with Alex Acuna. Oh yeah. He taught me a proper shaker. He taught me some of this stuff, but I can't go. Yeah. I mean, what a world-class player. World class. But he, he goes, uh, he's from, you know, Peru. He goes, man, you, you keep the shaker. He goes, keep it parallel. You start doing this, it's shake, shake, swing, no, swing, straight, straight out front, jack, 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 shaka, chicka, chicka. And, um, I learned, and he and Polino DeCosto. Oh man, so many records. Being around them, and I'm going, hey, how did you do? That? I know, I and again, I shake and do all that stuff like a white boy drummer. Did Paulino but, pass? You know what? Somebody, he might have. Man, dude would show up to a session with a panel truck of percussion. Yeah, and he goes, oh, he'd run out and grab something and come back in with, you know, here we're gonna play this now. And, uh, man, just the yeah. scene that I miss out there. Well, when I moved here the first time, there was no, there were no restaurants. Uh, it was a different world. And I also learned that as a session musician, you're going to give away a lot of stuff. You know, you do another pass or do these kind of things in LA. It's all, you know, it's, it's just money to be made. No, you can't, you, you can't on a demo session, rake them over the coals because you layered percussion. I layer percussion because that's it's a it's an attention to detail it's a it's a quality it's a thing that's gonna make the product better yes and that was my approach because it's thought, free well, <laughs> and i learned that from somebody else but when i for me i started getting these dates and i went i'll do whatever you need so i've always carried a a strap bag it's like a square it's a box but it's a bag and i I'm always, hey, let me do this. And I've, with a lot of people be, being left-handed, hang on, I want to show you what I do. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I can, I'll be right, I'm just over here on the, uh, can you hear this? Yeah, yeah. De yeah. Oh, yeah. I hear some bungles. <laughs> hang on. Gongas. Uh, gongas. Uh, oh, yeah. That sounds like a uh, doom back. It's a doom back. I've got a few of them. Not bad. Uh, I heard that from off camera. So I've been doing this for years. I've had to ask. They were having drummers run away from me while we're interviewing. <laughs> Dude, being left-handed, I guess it doesn't matter. And I started doing this years ago on dates, especially demos where they didn't have have a lot of time. I said, man, I'd love to do shaker and tambourine. And I do that on everything. I go, hey, I've got perk. Can I do perk? And uh, like you, and I never, yeah. I wasn't charging. But when I came from LA, I had to learn Oh, okay. So, and, I, and what I witnessed was guitar players actually kind of people co-writing the song in LA. If you'd done that, you'd be like Hal Blaine with co-writes. And, um, but it was just a different world. And I, but I embraced it and loved it. And it was good yeah. to me. Still is. But I, I, I said, look, overheads, I'm going to move them just a little bit. And, uh, and I'm going to do, I'm going to do this. And so, I hate that Zoom squashes that. It's like compressing it. But basically, you're playing. Okay, you're playing a sh shaker and tambourine at the same time. And you know what's really funny is that now that everyone layers things so much. Sometimes I, when I'm in a pinch, I'll do them both at the same time. And that's but, the only time I do it. Yeah, yeah. but it, you have so to. Yeah, I've got engineers. We don't have a lot of time, and I said, man, if we can split them out, and if you want to get just shaker parts, cut and paste and move them over. Yeah. Record dates, I do everything separate. Mills yeah. Logan, Matt McClure, all these guys like, I want it separate. Yep, and, separate. Uh, dude, I go on there. We'll have to get a coffee. And, yeah, and we, we, are, we are definitely over to do, to do the, uh, the thing in the flesh. But, I mean, there's just been so much information. And it's just a, a really great story. And congratulations on just an amazing career. You know what we could do is we'll close out with the, um, the Fade Five. What's your favorite color? That's a question. Yeah, I got five <laughs> questions. The five, the their fa favorite oh, five questions. Yeah, and then I wanted to just if there was anything music -y or career wise that you wanted to ask, feel free on that. But oh yeah, um, uh, 
man, I got to say blue. It's not yellow? Well, it was then. <laughs> Although I, you know what, I got to say, I do love, I do love yellow. I have, uh, I had a yellow car. I don't have a yellow car now, anyway. Now, yellow is a good one. Yeah, the right got to so, be the right yellow. Blue, you're wearing a, a blue puffer jacket. <laughs> um, what about a favorite food or a favorite dish? Oh man, there's so many good foods, and like you, I've traveled all over the world. Yeah, I got to tell you, I still love a good curry, Indian. There you go. Um, <laughs> Taj, there's a place called Taj Indian on Nolansville Road. It's kind of like the new Sitar. Remember, we everyone, everyone go to Sitar for the yes, buffet. Yeah. So now Taj Indian, it's on Nolansville and Harding. Okay. So maybe we'll I'll go to out. Taj with okay. Larry because Larry lo Larry Aberman loves the Indian. Yeah. So we can we can meet over there. What about a drink? What's your favorite drink? Well, I love a good strong, a good dark red cab. Nice. I like a good whiskey sour. Ooh, okay. And I, and I like a um, a brown ale, like I Jackalope. Like yeah. I, I like IPAs. Can't really do more than two because yeah. it's it really heavy and bloaty and farty. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, this one is really, really hard, but what is a song that keeps rearing its ugly head in your life and it's it comes on and you're on the PCH and your top is down, you're going to crank this thing up? Oh, wow. Man, I go through moods. Yeah. And lately, only because I'm going to Jamaica to, to do some teaching and playing in, uh, in nice. July. Great. But, man, for quite a while, I've been playing everything I can. Only because even, and I went and saw the Bob Marley film. If you haven't seen it, it's really good. Yeah. And so it's uh, just all kinds of stuff. Um, man, there's, it's kind of funny. It, that's a hard one to answer for one song. It is hard. Uh, yeah. I get that. I get, I go back and forth. So lately, Bob Marley. Um, that's so hard because there's so many. I might have to change the question because everyone has a hard time with this one. Um, but yeah, like like for me, for whatever reason, it could be because you have a relationship with the melody, the melody is an earwig, or you love the story, or you love the artist, or the timbre of the person's voice. Um, and this isn't even really a drumming song, but I love John Waits' Missing You. I think it's just a fantastically written song. Man, yeah. You know? So, you know, what thinking about even that with that title, um, there are songs. Ringo was hanging out. Keltner did a little bit. Jim Gordon did most of it. it was uh, Harry Nilsson, mm -hmm. and his version of "Can't Live." But there's a song called "I'll Never Leave You in the Garden Where Nothing Grows." Wow. There's no drums. Listen to it sometime, dude. Okay. The melody, the melody, and the lyric draw tears every time. All these years later, that yeah. came out in 1971. And I still listen to it. For me, along those lines, that'd be Jeff Buckley's Hallelujah. Oh, and do you have multiple versions of it? No, I mean, well, so Jeff Buckley did. You know what I got to say? Jeff Buckley's version was my favorite. Yeah, it's like it's like Brandy, goosebumps. Yeah. yeah. Brandy Carlisle. And, you know, he died right after that. Drowned. It's like it, he was 27, like Hendrix, like Mama Cass, like, you know. Yeah. I will say his version of that is in my top two and he would be well he would be the top yeah brandy carlisle did a live version on radio and man she goes comes back around and gets real gritty that's kind of mind-blowing she's and an amazing was, artist amazing that was my favorite and then when i got turned on to jeff buckley's that was the one i yeah it's on my phone that's great see I, it's really crazy and now what is your favorite movie you have a favorite movie uh i have scottish heritage and there's a lot of great films out there, but you know what? Braveheart. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you laugh, you cry, everything. Yes. Yes. Great. That's, film. A, that's a heavy one. Well, we're definitely going to have to get together in the flesh. It's long overdue, especially like, you know, we've survived so many things. You had this tragic thing happen to you. We survived an international pandemic. We got to get together. We'll do the thing, man. I'd like that. It'd be, it'd be I, really hope I, I hope I've given you something you can keep. <laughs> well, I think, you know what, I think, I think that, you know, usually we just air warts and all, yeah. and it's great because it's just a fun conversation. 
But what um, I mean is like as far as I wandered off in the, you know, all the personal things and things like that, but drum world or whatever. But yeah. I love the fact, and I interrupted you. I'm so sorry. No, I man. love that you're bringing in all kinds of people. I know that you had you done Brigadello. You've, you've done Dan Huff, who was, he and I kind of grew up in the ranks. I'll never yeah. forget having lunch with him one day. And he goes, Dan, Dan I got a, this was back in the eighties. We're playing on a record and uh, uh, we went to Fridays. I think it was still there on uh, over in um, hey, where was what, it? whatever part of that. All that stuff's gone now Yeah, uh, on church. And um, he goes, I have, a, my vision is I got my family here. I'm going to go to LA. I want to play on as much as I can. And then I want to come back home and produce. Well, he did that exact thing. That's exactly what he did. He made it happen. We were at, you talk about um, uh, eating yesterday. You ate a a third watch. Yeah. He and I would have have lunch or breakfast there um, every, like once a month. And I'll never forget one time we're sitting there talking and he goes, and this is Dan Huff, who's played on all these crazy records and produced all these hits. He goes, man, you know what? You and I are still doing it, but we're not the guy anymore. And I went, I kind of think you are. And he goes, no, 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 I'm not the guy. And he goes, you know, Jerry, Jerry's not, uh, some of the other guys I, I work with John, uh, John Conley a lot. There's a lot of these other guitar players that are the guy, but he, he basically taught me, you know what, keep doing what you do to the best you can. And I know you do that. And he goes, Dennis, you still got a groove. He goes, we just get to a place. We are not the guy. And I said, you know what? I was on a date with a lot of people where I wasn't the oldest and they were all talking about when we a lot of us first moved to town there was nobody past 50 doing sessions yeah and now i'm still a full-time drummer i'm 70 yeah man hey man and look I'm at look at look at kenny aronoff he's gonna be like 72 years old man you yeah. know what i mean it's yeah. like it's like in you're in you're in you know great shape and uh you're resilient and it's a priority and um i'm i mean i'm gonna you know, I, I'm going to die on stage. One, two. You know what I mean? It's like I, I am probably going to go out like that or maybe make a love. I don't know. That'd be fun. I'll take either one. But, um, you or know, you love on stage. Dude, we, we're just we're just very, very fortunate to be, um, you know, survivors and thrivers, man. We're just yeah. doing we're just doing it. I really appreciate this time. We'll get together. What what, what would be some advice is because I just put out a book called Making It in Country Music and Insiders Look at the Industry. The publisher liked me enough to give me a hardback so i always ask everybody um what advice would you give uh to someone that's coming to navigate nashville man or going to come in and navigate anywhere so and i love doing classes when i get to do them and i know that you i love the fact that when you're touring everywhere you go and i did that with a guy over in europe we always yeah. did sort of a music seminar and i always i love q a at the end and i always get the question how did you end up doing all this how did you end up doing this, Taylor Swift or whatever else? Yeah. Or anybody. And I said, I honed my craft and I practiced and played every day when I was a kid. I'd do my homework, I'd play, and then I'd go outside. I'd go surfing if the waves were up, but every day somehow I had a stick in my hand or two. I said, know your instrument. I get brought in to tune people's drums because apparently a lot of great drummers just don't know how to tune right i said learn how to make your instrument sound great take really good care of it and then when the phone rings be early you and i are drummers man joni she makes her crazy i go honey we gotta go and she goes but it's but i said honey i'm i can't be late anywhere and i i mean i need to be early if i'm not early i'm late and i try not to be a jerk about it but yes and i said so always be early be kind. And I've had moments with a, a couple of situations where it was like, you don't, you know what? I don't want to work for you anymore, but you do it. But one or two times in my entire career where I might have spoke out of, but man, Michael Rhodes was, well, he would go off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Michael <laughs> Rhodes told off. me, I, he goes, hey, kid, you're good, but uh, you need Ridlin. <laughs> I'll take so, it as a compliment. Man. But here's the important part. I would go when the phone rings. Always say yes. Yes. Unless it p- compromises your health or your belief system or whatever. Mm-hmm. I, dude, I turned down um, 
white wedding. Uh, uh, Billy Idol. Billy Idol. He was going out to, he was kind of doing a little bit of a swing back around in yep. the later 80s. Mm -hmm. And a bass player called me up and he goes, man, I'd love to have you come in. And so the manager calls, he goes, hey, I'd, would you like to come down and play for us? And I said, well, I want to ask something. Drugs and et cetera. And he goes, oh, plenty of it. And I went, I can't do it. Yeah. I got kids. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, and man, the tour, Pooh Bear did it. Mike. He told me, he said, thanks. And he said, dude, you, you, you dodged a bullet. He goes, the stage. When you walk in, the stage was female legs. Stage, big, huge stage, female legs, and the With drums. The band were in the middle. middle. Drums were in. Drums were in the crotch. And he goes, "That's where it started." And I went, "Well, that I might have been okay with that, except I've got people that I have to explain." Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, it was just one of those ones where I thought, you know, I don't know. It's crazy. And um, but I love. Did you have you met Mike Baird? Um, yeah, have we met, um, Mike and I have not met, but I heard he was, um, in the film industry now, like he does, um, drives the trucks like a teamster for, for, yeah, films. I think he, he moved on. There was a time, uh, the time in the seventies and eighties where he was, he was a cat. They, they yeah. called him Pooh Bear. Mm -hmm. And I, I always call him Mike, but I, I sometimes I refer to him as Pooh Bear because he got credits that way. Yeah. And uh and I had heard that he sort of walked away from all that. And um I'm thankful, man, that I'm still I'm still I'm still using these. Yeah, baby. <laughs> no, that's the thing. That's the thing. So that's great advice. Um uh be kind, be early, be prepared, uh, re uh refine your craft and make your instruments sound good. And there you go. That's the key to the castle. And uh, and also, also as a lot of guys have said and I've tried to do that more often than I have. And uh, I mean, even Hal, Hal Blaine, some of those guys, they always said, yes, sir. Thank you. I'll take another. Whatever stupid thing they ask you to do, yep. just go, okay. Oh, yeah. You want 18th notes on the hi-hat? I love 18th notes. Yeah. That's the yeah. story I tell everybody. This was so fun, buddy. We'll do, it in, we'll do it in the flesh. I really appreciate it. Hey, if somebody wants to ask questions or find you, what's the easiest way to do it? Denny Drums at Comcast.net. Denny Drums at Comcast.net. You heard it here. And to all the listeners, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the show. We appreciate you being here. And until next time, hey, we'll see you then. Thanks, pal. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. you very much. Pleasure to see you, my friend. This has been the Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.